Hello. Our story begins in the middle of the Boon to Eve Classic. The great Malastarian racers of Boba sabotaged young Skywalker's pod racer before the race began. And as they were trying to move out of the desert plains into the rock formations before the whip, Anakin's pod racer began to smoke. He quickly tried to regather his composure so that he could save himself and this race. He closed the flaps on his pod racer in the hopes that he could stop the fires from burning next to him. As he was doing this, Boba sped past him, taking the lead once more. Skywalker pulled a lever back and it completely extinguished the fire. Using his mechanical knowledge, he flipped some switches on the control panel to reroute energy from the right thruster into the left one. Slowly, it transferred over, but the engine wouldn't reignite. Anakin flipped the switch repetitively. He got the engine to reignite and he launched the racer forward, speeding into the whip right behind Saboba. Anakin was slipping behind as they rolled out into the hot flats. It was the final stretch of the race. Anakin was continuing to slip behind the highly talented and experienced racer. He believed he could catch up, and his smaller yet more agile speeder was able to close the distance in on Saboba. The moment they were next to each other, neck and neck, to become victor of the race, Saboba swung his hulking pod racer over. The shock was so heavy it disconnected the power inside of Anakin's left thruster and it slowly shot down. It was a good thing Anakin was able to construct the pod racer at such a level, because if he hadn't, like a number of the other racers in the field, he would have been killed by the smack his racer was dealt. Anakin tried to reignite the flame inside the thruster again, but it proved to no avail. His pod racer slowed down and he watched Saboba effortlessly slide in the first place. On the bright side, at least Anakin finished the race. While he wasn't in first place, it was impressive, especially for a human, let alone the fact that he was a 9 year old. Regardless, this was kind of an issue. Qui-Gon may or may not have bet Padme's ship on the race. While the fate of Anakin was left unchanged, being that he was simply remain a slave due to Saboba winning the race, Qui-Gon was extremely disappointed in himself, and Padme was extremely upset. They bet their mission on this plan, and now her people would continue to be starved and be killed. The entire point of her getting off world is so they could inform the Republic of what was happening on Naboo, which was not possible anymore. Now there was no ship, and to say she was upset would be an understatement. A Jedi that was meant to save her helped her get stranded on a backwater world like Tatooine with no help from anyone in the galaxy. Qui-Gon could try and get help from Quinlan Vos, but that would blow his cover. There'd be no point in exposing his mission. Qui-Gon was very apologetic to Padme, but he was genuinely surprised himself. He believed that Skywalker could win the race, and yet he wasn't the first to cross the finish line. While there were people in the race field congratulating Skywalker, nothing compared to the celebration surrounding Saboba. It was tragic. Skywalker didn't realize that he was up for the bet as well. He could have freed himself from slavery, but truthfully, he was most apologetic for failing Mr. Qui-Gon. He wanted so badly to impress him and help him get the Queen off world, but that seemed to be no longer an option for them. After some discussion, Qui-Gon informed the Queen, who he believed was still inside of her ship, that they would relocate her. Obi-Wan and Captain Panaka had to gather her supplies and her handmaidens to take them to the city of Mos Espa. Shmi and Anakin simply didn't have enough room for them in their home to accept them in. But it's alright, Qui-Gon wasn't going to force that on to them anyways. Instead, he'd be taking the Queen and her staff to Mos Eisley in the hopes that they could find a ship or a vessel or literally anything that would help them get off world. Qui-Gon did inversely tell Anakin that he would be back for him. He promised. Anakin was grateful for the promise, but nothing hurt him more than the thought of returning to his mundane life as a slave. He knew that Wada would belittle him for losing the race, which was something he didn't even want to think about at the moment. Wada was insufferable as it was, that would only make him even more annoying to listen to. Anakin and Shmi waved to their friends as they walked off and away from their small home. Padme was seething. While she couldn't reveal that she was the queen for safety reasons, she gave Qui-Gon an earphone, which was entirely appropriate for the great failure they had here. Luckily, by the time they were moving from Mos Espa to Mos Eisley, they were able to grab the last civilian transport. If they didn't, they would be stuck in Mos Espa for the night. Though, with the twin suns, it was still relatively bright out. The last transport on Boonta Eve Day was a lot earlier than usual. It was a big day on Tatooine, an event hosted by the Huts and seen across the galaxy. It was one of, if not the biggest races in the galaxy. So people who worked during the day and missed the race were able to get off early to at least celebrate the Boonta Eve replays, rewatches, and even the minor league pod races that redid the track. Qui-Gon and Padme were set to meet up with the Queen and Obi-Wan inside of Mos Eisley, as they had already arrived, having a bit of a head start on them. When Qui-Gon's transport arrived, he felt something in the Force. Unsure of what it was, he told Padme to stay behind him. They were traveling lightly. Jar Jar and R2 watched the Jedi Master as he sauntered forward. Before lightsaber ignited, the Sith Assassin leapt into the air. Qui-Gon couldn't see him. Maul's attack came from the direction of the suns, so when he looked at the dark figure moving towards him, he looked directly into the twin suns, which was temporarily blinding, and he had to ignite his lightsaber to defend himself. Qui-Gon rolled out of the way and parried a strike made by Maul. The Sith Assassin used the Force to launch Padme, Jar Jar, and R2 into the wall, knocking the two sentients out. 
Qui-Gon looked over and then back to Maul. The young Zabrak warrior wasted no time in igniting the second side to his staff and blasting it forward. Qui-Gon didn't have time to call for Obi-Wan, instead he moved back, quickly defending himself. The sound of lightsabers echoed out through the streets and people gathered around to watch the Jedi fight off this individual. Most people didn't know what a Sith was, but the action was so alluring. Qui-Gon was a talented duelist, but by his mid-40s, the fighting was a little hard for him. Keeping up with a duelist like Maul was arduous. He beat back every attempt to hit him, though, but Maul was relentless. He struck with fire in his eyes and had every intention of gutting every individual on the Naboo staff until he could get to the Queen. Obi-Wan and Captain Panaka could see the commotion coming from the crowds moving forward, and they looked to each other before moving forward to see what was going on. Qui-Gon held his own for as long as he could until Maul made the perfect strike. Bashing Qui-Gon's blade up and jabbing the blade through his stomach, it was a perfect strike, hitting all the key arteries and making the direct hit across his spinal cord. Maul kicked Qui-Gon to the ground, and as he did, he heard a cry. Maul turned around with his insidious yellow teeth showing. It was Kenobi. The apprentice was going to try and avenge his master. How quaint. Maul did a kick flip forward, which completely caught Obi-Wan off guard. His aggressive style mimicked Qui-Gon's, and he barely handled the strike. Obi-Wan stumbled backwards, and Maul aggressively continued forward. He could see the girl and the Gungan who were next to the wall get up. Captain Panaka was trying to get them to the Queen and her guard. Maul dipped below Obi-Wan and swung up, removing his left arm in its entirety before blasting him backwards with a force. Obi-Wan slammed through the wall of the building. Without missing a beat, Maul whipped his lightsaber out and cut through Panaka's back and decapitated Jar Jar and Padme with a force throw. He didn't stop there, he used a force to crush the astromech next to them before pulling his blade back into his hands and turning his head. Despite the Jedi being renowned heroes in the galaxy, people of the Outer Rim knew no such heroics. All they knew is the Jedi hid on their temple on Coruscant and let people in the Outer Rim suffer under the power of the Nile for generations. Now that the Nile were gone, the Jedi couldn't do anything but obviously lose, so the people applauded Maul. One of the people from the crowd ran forward to grab a lightsaber from Qui-Gon's dead body. Maul choked the man with a snap of the wrist, killing him instantly. He turned back to look for the Queen. The crowd parted away so he could run forward. It wasn't too difficult to find the queen. She had her headdress and her handmaidens wore fine cloth that was too bright to be found anywhere on Tatooine naturally. When he located the queen, he slaughtered her guards, killing the handmaidens, and stole her, bringing her back to his ship and leaving the planet. Maul would have stolen Skywalker, except he didn't know who Anakin was. If he knew that Anakin had any potential in the Force, he would have brought him back to his master. The true irony is, is that Maul believed that he had the real queen. He killed the real one in cold blood next to Jar Jar Binks. It didn't really matter. This individual was the head of state, and as long as she signed the peace treaty that the Trade Federation had crafted, then it wouldn't matter. Sidious needed this as an official document so he could prove how ineffective Valorum's leadership was. The Trade Federation had a purpose, but that came later. Maul took the Queen back to Naboo to meet with Nuke Gunray and the rest of the Federation Council, awaiting her arrival. Sabe was reluctant about the entire thing during the trip from Tatooine to Naboo, but there was only so much she could really do. Resisting a Sith apprentice could only last for so long, and she eventually caved in after she was tortured. She felt terrible, but her people were starving, and she needed the Trade Federation to end its blockade so she could save them. On Tatooine, Obi-Wan crawled out of the rubble. He saw no one around. The city streets had emptied out. His master's body was gone. So were the handmaidens, the guards, Padme, Jar Jar, and the astromech. He was extremely lightheaded, and so he stepped forward, trying to reach for the hole that was created when he was thrown through it, but as he reached out, he realized there was something missing. If it weren't for the lightsaber cauterizing the wound, he would have died. He was in such a fuzz. He tried to look for help, and then he called out his master's name. He still hadn't fully pieced together the events that transpired in front of him earlier in the day. He got out his communication device, but he couldn't contact the temple from this distance, so he searched around. He stood uneasily. His body wavered back and forth as he looked to the roofs of the nearby buildings. He felt so uneasy, but he slowly climbed the side of a building that had steps on it and found a large satellite. He could only hope this would get him the help he needed. He ripped a cord from the satellite and plugged it into his communicator and patched in for the old folks home frequency. He hoped that it was the right one. He fell to his knees and spoke into the communication device. He told whoever was listening that he was either in Mos Espa or Mos Eisley, but he needed help. Obi-Wan started to slowly recall the events from earlier in the day. As he remembered, he started to process everything. He told whoever was listening that his master had been slain. The Queen's guard and her handmaidens were killed by a Sith. His head slowly bobbed around until he said he needed help. He collapsed, leaving the recording on. Not more than a minute later, a couple thugs ran up speaking in weak way languages and dragged him away from the satellite and unplugged him. 
Inside the Galactic Senate, Senator Palpatine from Naboo requested an emergency session that was approved by Chancellor Valorum. The session kicked off with big news as Palpatine reinforced to the Senate that his planet had been attacked by the Trade Federation. He told them that the Queen was forced to sign a peace treaty because the Republic refused to aid her. While this was very untrue, no one was aware that the Chancellor Valorum had sent two Jedi Knights to the planet to resolve the issue quietly. The Republic had debated over the events on Naboo since the day it happened, and now with a peace treaty, Palpatine was able to suggest to the Senate that there be a call and a vote of no confidence in Supreme Chancellor Valorum. Palpatine stood on his platform, eyeing down the Coruscant-born leader of the Republic as the next step of his sinister plan came to fruition. The Senate voted against Valorum, and the Chancellor got to watch his Republic move away from him. Palpatine would become the leader of the Republic in due time. He would run an efficient campaign for leadership, and the Republic would have just fallen into his trap. He would use sympathy as her undoing. On Tatooine, Jedi Master Depa Balaba of the High Council arrived. She was here because Quinlan, firstly, wasn't contacted by the long-range communication, and secondly, because he was still on his mission. Depa moved quietly throughout the streets of the city, looking for Kenobi. First, she found the dead bodies of those who served the Naboo. They were collected up and thrown into an alleyway. She also found Qui-Gon's dead body. There it was as well. All their deaths confirming what Obi-Wan had said. Someone had a lightsaber, most likely a Sith. They'd apparently returned. She continued through the streets looking for Obi-Wan. It was nighttime, but basically early morning, and so it was hard to get a feeling for where she was. Depa wasn't undercover, and because she wasn't a big woman, a couple drunk pirates, the ones who had Kenobi, thought that they could capture another Jedi, the one that was sent to save the one they already had. It would be great business. They knew that the Jedi captured would be asking for help, so they were just waiting for this arrival. When Depa showed up, they figured that they could capture two Jedi, and they'd have more to offer to Jabba as a means to earn some credits. As they approached her, they were thrown back. She used the force and saw an open building that they came from, and so she entered it. The establishment was a gang cantina, one that specifically belonged to the pirates who took Obi-Wan. When she walked in, the music that was playing came to a stop. She looked at everyone and then saw Obi-Wan slouch over in the corner. Depa told them that she came here for her friend. There was no need to escalate the situation. The boss came out and told her that the situation had already been escalated. Depa kind of smirked as they drew their weapons. She was the apprentice to the master of the order, Mace Windu. This would be easy work for her. Depa threw her hands out and a number of the men flew back. She netted her lightsaber and went to work, avoiding killing, mostly disarming, literally. When she was finished, she went to Obi-Wan's side and helped him up. He was very badly hurt. She put herself under his one remaining shoulder and helped him out of the cantina. Depp and Obi-Wan eventually got back to her ship, and she quickly got to work. Obi-Wan woke up while she was applying back and getting some nutrients into him. Depp had tried to silence him, but he was adamant on speaking. He locked onto that slave boy he remembered Qui-Gon talking about. He was already hard to understand because he just didn't make any sense, but to her, this made even less sense. Slavery was outlawed. There was no way there could be slavery, not even this far out in the galaxy. How wrong she was. Obi-Wan pulled a small device from his belt that he took from Padme's ship. He didn't want Wada to get a hold of it. The device was a small file holder. Inside of it had everything from the mission. Obi-Wan had recorded everything during the mission just in case it was necessary. That's just the kind of person he was. So the small drive had the first-hand report from everything he saw on the ground and their escape from the blockade to when the ship was handed over to Wada's possession. Depa took the device and gave Obi-Wan some medicine to put him to sleep. She plugged it into the console in the cockpit as she prepared to return to Coruscant. As the information then popped up, she learned of the slave and then saw the midichlorian count. None of it made any sense. A slave, who was a boy, with a midichlorian count higher than Yoda's. It didn't seem real. She sat at the controls in silence for a moment. The engines hummed for a little bit before she decided that she would continue an investigation here on her own. She took a long-range communicator and told her astromech that she had that with her, that after they arrived in Mos Espa, to take the ship back to Coruscant. It was early morning when they first arrived at Tatooine, so it was still a little dark out. By the time she got to Mos Espa, the suns had started to rise. She was able to get out of the ship and into the streets before the early morning hustle got into full stride. She watched her shuttle take off and leave her here. She only hoped that whatever was here could be found soon. She was deeply concerned about this child that was referenced. If this kid was with that high of midichlorian count, then surely he was the one meant to bring balance to the force. She spent the first half of the day looking around, but then she was approached by a little boy who asked her if she was also a Jedi. This caught her attention. Most people in the streets didn't really care, they just ignored her, and as it turns out, the boy was the one that she was looking for. He was on his work break, so he'd have to return later on, but she quickly learned that this was the boy who interacted with Master Qui-Gon. As it turns out, slavery did exist out here. It was much worse than that, but Master Balaba wasn't the only Jedi having revelations. 
On Coruscant, the news was received about the death of Master Qui-Gon. While the Council was informed of his death, no one else knew about it aside from Dooku. It was just a hunch. They needed confirmation. They wanted to confirm everything before they actually said anything. And Master Balaba had done that for them. With knowledge that there was now a Sith, the Jedi took the situation with a lot more seriousness, mostly because the Sith had vanished into thin air after killing one Jedi and badly injuring another. A number of Jedi Master and Council members were dispatched to the Outer Rim and the planets that surrounded to see if they could find the Sith. On the other hand, the end of the blockade of Naboo allowed Palpatine to move on to his next part of his plan. Maul was his apprentice, and Plagueis was killed in his sleep. Sabe had to maintain the role of Queen, even though the legitimate one had been killed on Tatooine. Naboo was in a total state of chaos. With the droid forces leaving, the people had to clean up the mess of dead people and try and help those who were starved by the occupation. As the Jedi arrived into the Outer Rim for the first time in centuries, they only realized how detached from the galaxy they really were. They had neglected half the entire galaxy for way too long. They were seeing the effects of their neglect, and what it had done to the people of the Outer Rim. When the Jedi removed themselves from the Outer Rim, the Nile were the ruling party of the Outer Rim. It was marauders and pirates all ganged up into one massive superpower, one that was able to tear down the Starlight Beacon project. Now that the Nile were gone, there were nothing but a few groups of pirates with barely any semblance of what once stood. In place of the former group were a collection of crime families and syndicates. The Pikes, Huts, Black, Sons, and Zygerians were the largest of them. They all had their own space in the galaxy and they rarely encountered each other. The Jedi, especially those on the Council, couldn't believe that they had been such failures. While it was impossible to expect the Jedi to use all 10,000 members to save every single being in the galaxy, they did expect more from themselves. With Maul never being found, the countless Jedi returned to Coruscant. A couple things mentioned by the returning council members struck home for the council itself. Depa believed the Jedi should work on a coordinated effort to reduce slavery in the Outer Rim. This was concluded by Plo Koon, who happened to find himself on Zagiria, seeing what those animals were doing to the people they enslaved. Depa also picked up on where Qui-Gon left off, suggesting that the boy from Tatooine be saved and brought into the Order under her own guidance. Masters even Peel and Yaddle suggested that the Order combine their efforts with the hungry new Chancellor. They saw Palpatine as a chance to reinvigorate the Republic. Of course, there were those on the Council with more dogmatic views. These individuals had been on the Council longer than anyone else. Opa Rancisis, Yariel Poof, and of course, Yoda. The Master of the Order trusted his student's judgment and believed in what she was saying. The Council sat in debate for hours, and thankfully, due to so many voices having seen the carnage in the Outer Rim, they were able to drown out the voices of old. The Jedi had a chance, especially with new leadership in the Senate, to try and undo centuries of failure. Windu would be the one to suggest this to Palpatine, because Yoda was trying to understand where his student had gone. Dooku had seemingly vanished, and while Yaddo hadn't vanished, Yoda did seriously hope that Dooku didn't become a member of the Lost Masters. It was 19 at the moment, it would be 20 if he joined them. Inside the Chancellor's office, Master Windu apologized for coming in so soon after his election, but he had urgent news that he believed to be important. Palpatine was very warm and welcoming to the Jedi Master. He was playing the long game here. He had every intention of making the Jedi fall into his trap. Windu told Palpatine everything he and the Council discussed, and suggested that the Republic be much needed for this operation. Palpatine said the word war with a concerned look on his face. He stood up and asked the Jedi Master if he knew what happened to his people in Naboo. Mace expressed his understanding for what happened. Palpatine turned towards the window of his office and told Mace that the blockade destroyed his people. To suggest the Republic go into war would be doing the same thing as a trade federation. Mace disagreed, believing that they'd be liberating the people who'd been lost by the Republic. Palpatine was playing a game here. He knew what was being asked of him, and he knew what his answer was. He couldn't just give the answer as quick as he would like, because most people without the Force wouldn't be able to answer so quickly to something so large. Palpatine turned back and told the Jedi Master that it didn't seem so Jedi-like to try and begin a war. Mace did agree, but he expressed that a war is what was needed to stop slavery and take down the crime syndicates. The Jedi needed support from the Republic. Palpatine told Mace that it was a very noble effort. To try and save the galaxy in the way that they were trying to would be very greatly appreciated by those who continue to suffer. Palpatine asked Windu what he believed would come from this. Mace told him that the freedom and security of the Outer Rim would. There were so many people out there that needed to be helped. Palpatine told Windu that he always respected how dedicated the Jedi were. He would approve an effort to seize the Outer Rim. An army would be raised from the Republic and sent out to fight against the crime syndicates. Windu was extremely thankful and thanked Palpatine for his time. Palpatine saw nothing but a benefit from this. Why would he neglect an opportunity to make the Jedi and paint them as warmongers? It was a perfect time to make the Jedi look like they wanted to start wars, so that once the Clone Wars came around, they were already painted in a negative light. He just needed to do some extra work as his alternate personality. Good thing he still had Darth Maul. 
said he was so prideful and student that he could use him while Dooku began working with the Separatist. Dooku and Maul knew each other, but they didn't know each other, which was entirely intentional. Sidious would keep them away from each other and force them to begin new additions to his plans. Not for nothing, without ever having met Skywalker or heard of him, Sidious was completely under the impression that Maul would be his long-term student. Maul was the future. Dooku was the individual who would just help him get there. He had the brains to get the Separatist organization off the ground, while Sidious drove a war-driven, corrupt state into the ground. It was a perfect plan. With the Jedi getting the approval, Windu gathered together 500 Jedi who were willing to fight in the first leg of this. Because their order had the backing of the Republic, their first step would be taking Tatooine. This was mostly because it was already completely scouted out by Quinlan Vos and Depa Balaba. There is also the hope they'd be able to go and find the Sith who killed Qui-Gon on Tatooine. Quinlan's covert assignment was finished, especially with the war coming to the Outer Rim, so he and his student prepared for what was to come. They made sure that the civilian population was informed to take cover. The Jedi were going to act as a military force to bring an end to the corruption here in the Outer Rim. When the 500 Jedi descended on the planet, the population was taken aback, but with Jabba as a daimyo, his guard rose up to confront the threat. He had been their ruler for centuries, and he wasn't about to let the Jedi come to his planet and take down his criminal empire. Though, just to be on the safe side, Jabba had an escape vest prepared for himself. The Jedi made their way through the streets, arrogant as ever. They believed that people would just listen to them because they were Jedi, and they were so wrong. It only got worse when a bomb went off, killing a dozen Jedi. The ambush began. Without having a grip on the realities of war, the Jedi immediately had to adapt. The tension only continued from there. While the pirates came prepared with rockets, slug throwers, and any number of extra supplies to fight the Jedi, there were no match for the warriors the Jedi brought. The first conflict, which could only be called a skirmish, was a Jedi victory, but it came at a loss of nearly a fifth of their forces. Dozens were killed, and the rest were badly injured. With the council members present, they knew they made a mistake by going for the cities first. They should have targeted the palace, and so that's exactly what they did, as they quickly rerouted. At the same time as all this conflict, Depa was on a personal mission to rescue the boy from Watto. Obviously, Saver would come to an end across the planet, but because the council trusted Depa, they wanted her to take the child and bring him back to Coruscant. They didn't know how much the Sith knew, but they didn't want this boy falling into the hands of the Sith. It was very easily managed and handled by Depa, who got Skywalker and freed him and his mother and then took him back to Coruscant. This was approved because it was done through Depa instead of someone the council didn't trust. Out past Mos Espa at Jabba's palace, a siege began. It only made the Jedi understand why they requested Republic aid. Jabba's palace wasn't the most defensible position in the galaxy, but his bounty hunters made the most of it. One of those bounty hunters being Jango Fett. He didn't work with the Huts all that often, and he wasn't a go-to mercenary for Jabba, but they did exchange information with each other. Jango just happened to be here and defended the palace, because he knew that the Jedi wouldn't be kind to him if they captured him, or the Huts wouldn't be either if they lost. Once the Jedi broke down the gates of the palace, they split up. Mace Windu was leading the charge. Yariel Poof split off with the duo of Jedi, while Eeth Koth went in a different direction. Yariel was unfortunate enough to be the Jedi to run into Jango. He and the other two Jedi fought their hardest, but the Mandalorian bounty hunter made sure it worked with them. Yariel was lit on fire, while the other two Jedi were tied up like wild animals and executed. Jango began an escape, but it didn't fully pan out for him. Slave One was parked in the palace hangar bay, but the Jedi shut down the facility's electrical systems. They didn't want anyone escaping. Windu made it clear that they weren't executioners, but if the pirates didn't surrender, then they had to be dealt with. Jango, who made his escape through the back end of the palace, ran through the wrong door and confronted Windu in the hangar bay. With hundreds of Jedi scouring not just the hangar bay, but the several other crevices in the palace, there was no escape for Jango, especially as he met his end at the hands of Mace Windu. The Jedi were able to capture Jabba and a number of his elite guard, who were collectively hiding inside a stale barge. The battle cost him dozens of mercenaries, and it also cost him Tatooine. As the Jedi claimed victory, a Republic shuttle full of Republic troopers landed and apprehended Jabba. It didn't stop there, though. These troopers were here to liberate, and anyone who was found with slaves or even accused of slavery would be taken away. The Republic wasn't playing, and this was very in part due to Palpatine, though he didn't realize how troublesome the death of Jango Fett would be for his Grand Army of the Republic. The Kaminoans already had the clone trooper genome, but without the host still being alive, the cloners needed to be perfect. They hadn't started pumping out the clones from the birthing tubes yet, because they were still experimenting with the genotype. Without knowing of his death, they didn't know how precise they had to be. The Republic troopers who arrived here were not greeted with kindness. They were seen as oppressors who had neglected a people for generations. It seemed more like a conquest than anything else. This again played into Palpatine's plan. He was going to make the Jedi-led invasion of the Outer Rim look like it was forced by the Jedi, and then when the Republic couldn't support the Outer Rim, it would again look like the Jedi knew about it but disregarded this. While Palpatine bringing this to the Senate was accepted and generally applauded, in due time it would bite the Jedi in the back. 
especially the planets like Tatooine, Obadiah, Nalhada, Zygeria, and a load of other scum-ridden worlds when they got representation inside the Republic. Palpatine expertly maneuvered through the Senate to get people to see this move as one led by the Jedi exclusively, but it did tie the Jedi and the Republic closer than ever before. With Tatooine under Republic control, the armies of the Republic spread out. Real issues began under Republic occupation. While the Jedi and the warriors of the Republic were crusaders trying to set people free from oppression, those who stood guard over these Outer Rim worlds treated the citizens like second-tier people, like they weren't worthy of being a part of the Republic, which was the issue with sending core-bred troopers into dirt holes like Tatooine. There was a completely different way of life in each sector, and it made the guards and the troopers seem pretentious to say the least. Each outpost in the Outer Rim would have a couple Jedi with them, but the people didn't look at them with any fondness. That wouldn't be changed until they saw any change in their daily lives. As of right now, it seemed like the Republic was just taking territory to expand their rule as a police state, nothing more. It wasn't seen as a humanitarian war. On the brighter side, the slaves were happy, and many of them enlisted in the local militias, but this again created a divide between the people and the Republic. They were seen as traitors to the Outer Rim, when in reality becoming a Republic Trooper was the best way to support someone's family, especially after they were freed from slavery. Inside the Jedi Temple, Yoda's esteem had dropped significantly. Every week there were more Jedi bodies returning to the Temple to be buried. The war was taking its toll on the Order, and many of those who volunteered to fight on behalf of the galaxy suffered the ultimate price. Though there were criminals and syndicate leaders coming back in cuffs to Coruscant, where Palpatine was levying some of the hardest penalties he could against them. Depa Balaba was also completely in charge of Anakin Skywalker. He was her student, and he loved her. It didn't take long for the two of them to develop a bond. Anakin felt terrible what happened to Qui-Gon, and he blamed himself entirely for the death of Qui-Gon, the Handmaidens, and so on. He felt especially terrible because of Padme's death, which he also believed was so unnecessary. This pain forced Anakin to absolutely abhor the Sith. He wanted to crush them with his bare hands, but Depa, like a mother, would turn his rage into compassion, erase his pain with care and guide him through the difficult adjustment period. Anakin and Depa formed their bond very quickly. All the struggles that Anakin initially had were able to come easy to pass through with the guidance of an experienced Jedi Master. Kenobi, on the other hand, was given the rank of Jedi Knight and passed his trials. He was also able to have a new prosthetic arm and then join the Republic on the active battlefront. The first few planets in the Outer Rim were easy to capture, but as easy as it was, the war got more intense very quickly. The crime syndicates learned about what was happening and they forced their slaves to fight on the front lines for them which put the Jedi and the Republic into a difficult bind. Republic commanders went on recon missions with Jedi to shut down restraint stations, which kept the slaves working for their captors. Essentially, it was a hangman's noose tied around each of the slaves' necks. If a single one of them rebelled, then four of them would be killed instantaneously. It was really effective, and because the crime syndicates wanted their power, it worked to perfection. The war against the syndicates looked like an easy route, but as it turned out, a lot of underworld activity relied on the Outer Rim which meant people from Hosnian Prime, Coruscant, Raxis, and a number of other prominent and wealthy systems rerouted to the Outer Rim to fight off the oppressors. They wanted to keep their crime rings alive, and many of them believed that if the syndicates fell, they would lose their credits and their power too. The war heated up, and this benefited Palpatine as well. Riots would start in core worlds as people's family members had been killed off by the war. Fathers, sons, daughters, mothers. And yet again, all the blame was directed towards the Jedi. Yoda thought about removing the Jedi from the war, but he knew it would only make the situation worse. Palpatine was able to call the situation a state of emergency, and he granted himself more executive powers, which just made everyone bow down to him. He went from Chancellor to Dictator, and the Jedi were too preoccupied to notice. Maul did a terrific job of mounting up the crime families into an alliance, while remaining in the shadows, at least. Though Dooku wasn't having as much luck. Many of the corporate businesses, especially the ones with a lot of droid forces and self-sustained militaries, didn't want to join a Separatist alliance. To them, they were making plenty of money off the war. Then again, there was another issue. While the first genotype of Jango Fett was good, they weren't able to continue extracting from Jango, so bad batches were extremely frequent on Kamino. This wasn't units of special forces, these were units that were completely defective. Kaminoan technology was fantastic, but it was being held back due to the sheer size of the army they were trying to create. The Republic armies were elite, but the crime syndicates lodged in due to centuries of surviving against the power of the Nile, they were perfectly prepared for Republic assaults. All of this continued to add to Sidious's fire. The Jedi were on battlefronts constantly, but they were winning. The crime syndicates began to crumble, and as the end of the war seemed to be looming on the horizon, an outpost on Tatooine was bombed. They're rebels. The people of the Outer Rim wanted to see change, especially if the Republic was going to be here, and with no change in sight, it was insult to injury. Without permission of the Jedi, the Republic came back with vengeance. The class war between the Mid-Rim and Core Worlds with the Outer Rim heated up. 
with an outpost being bombed that only led to more calls for either abandonment of the Outer Rim or harsher standings. A future Emperor loved the idea of cracking down, and so that's what he did, it only continued to look like the Jedi's doing. Maul being the one who was behind the bombing continued to make his master proud of him. Dooku, on the other hand, wasn't getting any further. Many of the potential systems that would have joined him didn't. They had a more united voice with the Republic, because the Republic was against the Outer Rim. It wasn't the core versus the Midrim, it was the core in the Midrim versus those animals out in the Outer Rim. Dooku felt his grip slipping. Of course some systems were sympathetic to his cause, but without the support of the banking clans and trade federation, Dooku didn't really have much going for him. They were both crucial. The banking clans could fund the military creation inside the Foundries and Genosis, and the trade federation army was almost larger than the Republic's, even though it was just the B1 type battle droids. Dooku was also in the hot seat. The clone army should have been around 200,000 units with a million more on the way, but they were nowhere near that quota. There were about 13,000 units that made it through the initial phase with about 403 units following them. The Grand Army of the Republic wasn't so grand. With cities breathing down Dooku's neck like it was his fault for his struggles, put him off. A lot. He wasn't very appreciative of it, but he couldn't really do anything about it, could he? The Temple on Coruscant continued to be a hub for brewing warriors. The Jedi trained harder than they ever did, and they went into war. Because this was a Jedi-led war, the Order lost more than 1,500 members during the four and a half years since the war began. Yoda was inching closer and closer to stepping down from the Council, especially because so many members had to be replaced. After Yariel's death on Tatooine, Keri Mundi got glassed by a ship when it crashed down to him on Hypori. Eeth Koth got killed in the middle of a slave uprising he started on Zagiria, and both Even Peel and Yaddle died during the storming of the Zagirian Castle. In a war against sentience, it was harder for the Jedi, which is why their numbers were so terrible. Sentience were harder for them to kill, and they were so unpredictable, unlike battle droids. Anakin Skywalker was almost 15, and his master truly believed he'd be ready for the trials, but she didn't suggest it for him. There was so much more her boy needed to finish before he was ready. But the Master and Apprentice Bond were experts at quelling uprisings in Coruscant districts as well as many other core world lower level or outer limit districts. Anakin learned to speak with his words before his lightsaber, and with someone like Deppa he only continued to get better at what she taught him. Anakin and Deppa had very little interaction with the war, but the little that they did only convinced Anakin to deter from the darkness, seeing the worst of it in the war from what little he did see. The remaining syndicate in the war with any power was the Black Suns, but with their allies all dead or captured, there was not a fighting chance in the galaxy for them. Typically a siege in the Outer Rim lasted for months, but they only lasted for weeks. The war was won, but it wasn't. Darth Maul had done his master's bidding and small rebellions began popping up all over the Outer Rim. The people of the core had twisted and turned their arguments against the Jedi, but their final one was that the Jedi cared more about the people in the Outer Rim than anyone else which wasn't true. It didn't matter. They were still targeted as if that weren't the case. Sidious, on the other hand, was fuming. He was ready to kill Dooku. He was a failure. Dooku was meant to be this brilliant politician, one who could turn a separatist regime into a competitor against the Republic. Yet, little ground was broken. Sidious was patient, but with the clone armies nearly a fever dream, he couldn't help but blame Dooku, especially when Maul was being so much more effective with lesser beings. The Separatists were supposed to be civilized, and yet Maul was able to scrounge together a bunch of scrummy pieces of work in the Outer Rim. It was a tragedy. Maul had grown through his skill. Every so often, he was permitted to slaughter a couple Jedi. It was his treat, though there was one benefit to the war for the Republic. A warrior from Kaylee had been badly damaged and saved by the Jedi. The warrior who took the name General Grievous became obsessed with fighting off the scum who almost killed him. The Jedi, to him, were heroes, and he believed he owed them a life debt for saving his life. With the war over, Sidious knew it was time to force his hand elsewhere. Maul had proven himself to be a capable student, and so Sidious made his way to Sereno. He would kill his other student for his inability to finish his mission, let alone get it off the ground. By this point, all the support for Dooku's idea had vanished. It was just him standing on an island trying to spout out about the elitism of the Republic. Sidious would have sent Maul, but truthfully, he didn't believe Maul would have been able to beat Dooku. The Count was a generational talent with a lightsaber, and Sidious was confident in himself, because he was much more powerful in the Force than Dooku. When Sidious entered the throne room, Dooku was standing. Sidious told him to kneel, and Dooku informed him that he never should have joined him. The dark side was so fraudulent. Dooku's epiphany came when he realized that Qui-Gon would have never joined him, and most of Dooku's wants had been fulfilled by the Jedi Syndicate War, which is what the press dubbed the war that engulfed the Outer Rim. Dooku felt so stupid for what happened, but he'd rather figure it out now than later. If he waited forever, then he'd only be hurting himself. Dooku ignited his crimson lightsaber and told Sidious that he came to Sereno to die. 
Sidious admired his arrogance, but he ignited his own weapons, leaping across the room at a furious speed. Sidious threw both of his blades forward, but Dooku was prepared. He stepped back, moving with elegance. He held one hand behind his back, ever so cockily, moving around the room. And then he whistled. Four Magna Guards turned on their staffs and jumped down to greet the Sith Lord. Sidious called Dooku a coward, and Dooku paced around telling Sidious he only wanted one thing. Sidious looked over and Dooku grinned, telling him that he wanted to only bring peace and order to the galaxy. Sidious was clipped and he raged, lifting the Magna Guards, but their feet had magnetized to the ground. Dooku lunged forward and swung, cutting through a lightsaber and part of Sidious' hand. Without missing a beat, Dooku launched lightning into Sidious' eyes. He stepped back and the guards moved forward, spinning their staves. Sidious opened his eyes, using the force to see with the best of his abilities. He was so embarrassed, but he was defending himself as best he could at the moment. At the same time, Dooku just watched Sidious try to defend himself with half of his vision. Dooku requested Maul to come to the castle of Sereno. He had important information regarding their master. Maul quickly answered the call and decided to come. Dooku just watched that he fend himself off. As he cut down the guards, he lost sight of Dooku. The chaos of the battle got the best of him and he was killed from behind. Several hours later, Maul would arrive, and he would walk with Dooku until he was assassinated in the garden. Dooku knew Maul wouldn't join him, but he at least wouldn't give him a semi-peaceful death in the garden. The political atmosphere of the Republic continued to get worse. It was a difficult situation to maneuver, mostly in part to the war, and now the absence of Palpatine. With so much adversity, Bail Antilles was able to use his prominent position as a longtime Alderanian senator to garner support for his cause. Though this only made things worse because unlike the rising Bail Organa, Bail Antilles was a core elitist, which made the entire Outer Rim situation worse. Dooku used his prominence as a Count of Sereno that challenged his authority and even called him a fraudulent leader. Dooku was taken as a threat, and therefore the Jedi were seen even more as a threat, mostly because Dooku used to be one of them. Though Dooku's big brain maneuvers allowed him to dig up some old information regarding Antilles past, which exposed his dealings during the Jedi Syndicate War, the ones that helped him turn a great profit during the war. Like many others in the war game, he made his cash off of some of the Kanto by big time sellers. The war machine was huge, and it was very profitable. This exposure helped him get removed from power. The individual who rose to power after Antilles was a widely liked senator from Raxus named Avi Singh. As a mid-rim individual, he could represent both the Core Worlds and the Outer Rim, in a fair way. While the Sith were dead, the Jedi had no clue. Dooku did inform them of their death, and how he wished that they continue their quest to help others. He was only showing any care for them because of their actions to engage in the Outer Rim, and how much of a surprise it took him by. With Chancellor Avi Singh, there was a chance for rebirth of a High Republic, but it would take time. Some of Maul's rebellious groups still had a strong presence in the Outer Rim, so they had to be silenced. But as Dooku revealed, in the next five years or so, there would be the perfect military force to keep those rebels at bay, so that soldiers of the Republic could return home. Depa Balaba raised Anakin into a Jedi Knight, and as he reached the rank of Knight, he immediately applied for the Tatooine Outpost, which he was granted. He'd be able to spend time with his mother and come to peace inside of his own heart, being able to protect the planet he once hated. General Grievous, despite his warrior past, was able to become a respected leader in the Republic. While his tactics weren't always the most sound, his leadership was highly admired, especially because he stopped rebellions before they could even form. Grievous and Kenobi became friends, as they had a stake in the seizure of Obadiah. Despite their friendship, Grievous could not stand Obi-Wan's humorous side. As the war came to a conclusion, Yoda stepped down from the role of Grand Master, which was given over to Mace Windu, a hero of the Jedi Syndicate War. The one to replace his role was Master Kit Fisto. The Jedi had an active role in the Outer Rim as well. With a number of Republic outposts on formerly wild planets, the Jedi were actively out there helping people. It led to a resurgence in positive imagery for the Jedi. Mace decided it was time to usher in a rebirth of the golden robes that were once so identifiable during the High Republic. The Age of Corruption still existed, but with a semi-united galaxy under the leadership of a mid-rim politician, the chance for a balanced galaxy was more likely than ever before. And that, my friends, is our story. Again, special thanks to Galvin Gaming, Tristan, Darth Revan, Pim Thetty Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo Wewoo 670, Anakash Dank Runner, CT7567, Oz of Oz, Darth Nox, the Eternal Padawan, Nox, Jenny Nguyen, Sansa Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Kallik, Yonling Sire 66, Mad Studios, Anakin 003, Fortis Lexi Star Wars, Lemon Knight, Rex the Wolf, Mirror Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Smash that like button. If you want to support in other ways, go check out the Patreon. There's other updates on there. Let's talk about the story real quick because I'm going to say something that's going to be addressed in the comments. I know I know the first comments will be like, well, why didn't you do Anakin Bounty Hunter? That's coming soon. That, that, that deserves a video by itself. I, I don't want to ruin that. That I'm not going to lie. It's a 100,000 subscriber special. I, I'm I'm shooting for something bigger than Anakin never discovered. Okay? 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 Bear with me. Patience is a virtue. Otherwise, 
the story I wanted to do something a lot different actually and originally I was gonna have the Clone Wars happen but by the time I got around to that point I was like well it doesn't really fit like it just doesn't naturally develop to that point and I kind of like it because it kind of lets me avoid the entire Clone Wars it lets me avoid Attack of the Clones through Revenge of the Sith and kind of work with a time period that we don't really see a lot of and that's that time between uh, Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones and so it allows me to play with how Palpatine rises to the power and how we can use that arrogance against him in the way for the Jedi to obviously go out the galaxy and do something that was very unlike the Jedi from the prequels. But if the Jedi can be heroes, be literally the antithesis of what they are in the prequels. So anyways, I hope you all enjoyed it. It was a fun story, kind of different war, different kind of direction. Anyways, I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the force be with you.